we just finished some uterine physiology. Let's move on to uterine pathology. A little bit more about the uterus. There's three layers. There's the endometrium, which was the star of the show in our uh, menstrual cycle reveal video. And this is a mucous membrane lining of the uterine cavity. And it's composed of glands on top of stroma. And this is the stuff that was growing uh, by estrogen stimulation and then maturing through progesterone. And the stuff that was shedding due to the withdrawal of progesterone support. And then next is the myometrium. This is the muscle layer underneath the endometrium. And it's responsible for uterine contractions. Finally, our third layer is the serosa. It's just an outer layer of the uterus. Now, before we talk about different uh, pathologies of the uterus, I want you to think about two things. I want you to uh, think about, let's see, four things. Let's keep four things in mind. We think about symptoms. We're going to think about pain. What kind of pain is the patient going to experience? We're going to think about um, bleeding. We're going to think about uh, vaginal bleeding. Because remember, the endometrium sloughing causes bleeding. We're going to think about fertility. Because this is like the key, uh, key role of the uterus. And finally, we're going to think about how it feels on exam. Okay? And if you remember... All to think about all these things when you know the fatal physiology of each disease, you're going to be able to derive pretty much all the presentations of uterine pathology, which is why I love uterine pathology. It's super easy once you think about it like this. So the first thing to look at is Asherman syndrome. And another name for this is intrauterine adhesions, which basically tells you what it is. It's, it's adhesions and fibrosis of the endometrium and loss of the basalis layer of the endometrium. And it's usually caused by uterine, uterine curettage. So what that is, and another name for that is dilation and curettage. And you dilate the cervix, you stick some instrument in, and you scrape off the endometrium, which is curettaging. So if you're going to do that and you end up losing the basalis layer, what's going to happen to your pain? Well, first of all, there's not really much pain. What's going to happen to bleeding? And what's going to happen to fertility? What happens is that you have secondary amenorrhea and infertility. You do not bleed because there's no basalis layer, so your endometrium doesn't grow, so there's nothing to slough off, so there's no bleeding. And there's, there's uh, infertility because your endometrium can't grow, it can't mature, there's no nice place for the blastocyst to implant, so, so there's no implantation. Okay, easy peasy. Next thing is leomyomas, which are also known as fibroids. If you look at the name already, you already know it's a benign smooth muscle tumor of the uterus. And this is estrogen sensitive. So again, how is, it, how is this going to affect pain? How is it going to affect bleeding? How is it going to affect fertility? And how is it going to present on the exam? So, for pain, it's going to hurt. If you just think about it, if you look at it, it's going to hurt. Bleeding, there's increased surface area of the endometrium. If you look here, there's increased surface area. So there's more bleeding, more, uh, more endometrial glands, more sloughing and bleeding. If you just look at this, this is not a nice place for a baby to grow. It's very irregular. So you basically get a lot of infertility and miscarriage. And on exam, what you're going to see is this is a benign smooth muscle tumor. So it's going to feel bumpy and it's going to feel firm. And there's often multiple tumors, so you're going to feel multiple bumps. Finally, additional symptoms you can see are, first of all, ex excuse me here, that's a typo. Um, additional symptoms will be urinary and bowel symptoms. And it's pretty obvious if you think about the location and look at these big, big ass tumors. The uterus is right next to the bladder. So if these big tumors compress the bladder, decreasing the bladder volume, you're going to get urinary frequency and other symptoms. And the uterus is also right next to the rectum. So if this um, tumor pushes on the rectum, compresses it, you're going to get constipation. Poop can't leave. And now on histology and also on gross exam, there's going to be a white world pattern. And that's important because we're going to talk about our next one, which is leosarcoma in a sec. Um, first, let's go back to fibroids and look at the treatment. And it's kind of low yield, but it's basically you only treat if it's symptomatic. So you symptomatically treat, you give some NSAIDs for pain, 
if they're bleeding too much you give some antifibrinolytics and if you want to reduce the size you give them give them some GNRH, GnRH agonist and that goes back to the estrogen sensitivity so this GR, GnRH agonist actually basically you get some constant stimulation you shut down the FSH and LH and decrease estrogen production so you're going to decrease the size of these fibroids and eventually you want to cut them out if they're causing too much symptoms all right, so now we can talk about leiomyosarcomas. And if you look at the name, it tells you again that's a sarcoma. So it, it is a malignant growth of smooth muscle of the uterus. This actually usually arises de novo. So it does not come from fibroids. It comes just by its own process. And it's often seen in postmenopausal women. So symptoms here is that it's usually a single lesion with hemorrhage and necrosis. And this is in contrast to fibroids, which are multiple lesions, and fibroids do not have hemorrhage or necrosis. And on histology, you see pretty much the same thing. You pretty much guess it. You see necrosis, and then like every other cancer, you're going to see increased mitotic activity, and you're going to see cellular atypia. So endometriosis, again, thinking about our five things. First of all, we're going to talk about what it is. This is endometrial gland spreading outside of the endometrial cavity. If you look at the name, it kind of tells you that it's, it's related to the endometrial glands and osis means there's some problem going on. So it's spreading outside of the endometrial cavity. So it's usually local, so it can spread to the fallopian tubes, it can spread to the ovaries or just in the surrounding areas around the, around the uterus. But it can also go to the lungs. And I just, this is, I thought this was an interesting story, so I'm just going to waste your time for maybe one minute and tell you about it. There was a patient kept having recurrent pneumothoraxes. They had no idea why. And it wasn't like that tall, thin patient that you would think about with getting the spontaneous pneumothorax. So eventually they took a look in there, and what they found was they found endometriosis in her uh, pleural space. So that just illustrates that this can go anywhere. So there's several theories of why this spreads. The first theory and prevailing theory is retrograde menstruation. So, so those endometrial glands, when they slough off, instead of going down, they actually go backwards. So they can go into the fallopian tubes and into the ovaries. But that doesn't really, like, that doesn't explain how you can get endometriosis in the pleural splices or, every, or other parts of the body. So we have a second theory, and that's of lymphatic spread. In reality, my guess is that there's probably multiple mechanisms going on. So, how is this going to affect pain? How is this going to affect bleeding? How is this going to affect fertility? Uh, and how is this going to feel on exam? So I think the hallmark of this disease is pain. It's going to be pain because there's um, these glands implant in the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. They're going to bleed. They're going to cause irritation. These glands should be not, should, are in places where they should not be. So this is the key finding here. There's going to be pain wherever they implant. They can implant in the bladder, so you're going to get pain with peeing. They implant in the rectum, so there's pain when you're pooping. Fertility, if they land in the fallopian tubes, and block it up and basically cause infertility. Another key finding here is a chocolate cyst. That's when they implant in the ovaries, and then they bleed. And then in the next cycle, they bleed a little more. And then the next cycle they bleed even more, and that's how you get all this blood in this in this over here, and that's a chocolate cyst because it looks like blood. And on exam, you can have uterosacral nodularity. So that's the uterosacral ligaments. And if your endometrial glands are basically implanting on the ligaments, they're gonna feel bumpy. And finally, there's actually no bleeding. And if you think about it, it actually makes sense because these glands, think about it, if they're in the ovaries. Again, remember they're bleeding, but they can't leave the ovaries. They can't leave down the fallopian tubes, so they're just bleeding inside. And they're not leaving the vagina, so you do not see increased uterine bleeding. So let me just emphasize not no increased uterine bleeding. Of course, they're still going to bleed normally. All right, so the next thing is treatment. Is treatment is um, OCPs and NSAIDs. NSAIDs are just um, symptomatic, just to reduce the pain. And the uh, uh, oral contraceptive pills, um, what they do is they regulate, what is it? They regulate the menstruation. So there's, uh, 
Oh, first of all, remember the endometrial glands are stimulated by estrogen. And so the, the menstrual cycle, your estrogen goes up, 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 and then slowly goes down, something like that. This is a very basic depiction. In OCPs, you get this low constant level of, of estrogens. So you get less growth of the endometrial gland, so there's less irritation. All right, the next thing is adenomyosis. This is super similar to endometriosis, but instead the endometrial glands lodge up in the myometrium of the uterus. And you can actually derive this from the name, which is adeno, adeno is for gland, and meiosis is the myometrium. So I love this disease because if you look at the name, you can tell the pathophysiology. And then if you look at the pathophysiology, you can tell all the symptoms. So we're gonna do the same thing as we did before. Um, regarding bleeding, it's going to bleed. It's going to bleed a lot because you have a bunch of glands. Your uterus is going to enlarge. And on exam, it's going to feel like it's going to be a really big uterus because you have all these glands in the myometrium. So it's going to enlarge. And let's see, enlarge. So you've got an enlarged uterus. And instead of fibroids, which have this firm uterus because it's a smooth muscle tumor, here you get a boggy. It's like a mushy feeling because endometrial glands are not very firm. And finally, the, finally, there's going to be pain because, again, endometrial glands are where they should not be. They're bleeding inside this myometrium. That's going to be painful. And the way we treat this is um, the same thing as endometriosis. I just explained it, so we're not going to... First, going to talk about some endometrial hyperplasia, and then I'm going to talk about endometrial cancer. And these are basically gradients of each other. So endometrial hyperplasia is hyperplasia of endometrial glands as compared to stroma. So there's relatively more endometrial glands than stroma. That's actually kind of important to know. Uh, and the risk factors are anything that increases estrogen ex um, exposure. Because remember, estrogen causes stimulation of those endometrial glands to grow. And this is pretty important because it's, it's a, it basically tests your understanding of every other uh, reproductive pathology. So causes of est estrogen exposure, increased estrogen exposure, are things like PCOS and ovulatory cycle. Excuse my writing. And um, uh, granu uh, let's see, obesity, granulosa, cell tumor. And you actually don't have to memorize any of these. As long as you understand how each of these works, then you'll be okay. And actually, I haven't told you about PCOS and an ovulatory cycle yet, or granulosa cell tumors. But what happens is PCOS basically leads to an ovulation. And so you still get the estrogen, so your endometrium still grows but in the metro cycle, but you don't ovulate, so there's no progesterone. So there's no progesterone, so you never get that withdrawal of progesterone, so there's no sloughing of the endometrium. So the next cycle comes around and you still have this uh, extra endometrial glands and you get more estrogen and then so your endometrial glands grow even more. And so this can lead to hyperplasia of endometrial glands. Um, granulosa cell tumor, basically it's a tumor that secretes estrogen. So that's how this happens. And obesity, if you remember, fat cells are also a place where you can get estrogen. Well, you get a derivative of estrogen, which is called estrone. So if you're obese, you have more fat cells, you get more estrone made and that is a risk factor. Finally, um, hormone replacement therapy, just giving estrogen. Um, maybe you have a menopausal woman who's really symptomatic, you give her estrogen. That's a risk factor for endometrial hyperplasia. And the way this presents is postmenopausal uterine bleeding. Um, I think the first thing, it's not the most common cause, but it's the first thing you have to think about is, is this cancer, is this endometrial hyperplasia? So when you en actually end up taking a biopsy of this, uh, you can actually classify the histology in two ways. You can say, is this with or without cellular atypia? And you could say, is this growth pattern simple or complex? And these are important prognostic indicators with atypia being the key. So uh, atypia is a better prognosticator. So if you have a, a person with cellular atypia, but they have simple growth pattern, that's still worse than someone with a complex growth pattern without atypia. So remember, atypia is, is the better prognosticator. And um, endometrial cancer is a malignant growth of endometrial glands. And again, this is usually due to too much estrogen leading to the uh, endometrial gland growth and uh, to eventually dysplasia and eventually cancer.
But sometimes this can also arise sporadically with uh, off usually it's like a p53 mutation or something leading to dysregulation in the cell cycle and again same thing dysplasia leading to cancer so risk factors again are the same thing it's anything that increases estrogen exposure and the other thing is increased uh, menstrual cycles so if you start your um, menstrual cycles earlier in life that's called uh, early menarche or if, if you never have kids then you get increased menstrual cycles and it's the same thing you're gonna get um you basically get more hyperplasia of the glands and more risk for cancer and presentation postmenopausal uterine bleeding because cancers bleed and i just want to point out that this grows in the endometrium it starts in the endometrium and then it can start in the endometrium and in stage 1b it can extend into the myometrium and go from there so that's it for uh, the cancer so now i'm going to do a quick overview of how to approach abnormal uterine bleeding because everything we just talked about can cause abnormal uterine bleeding so fibroids the defining features are that it's an irregularly enlarged firm uterus and just remember it's it's those smooth muscles so it's going to be firm it's going to be and there's multiple so it's going to be irregularly enlarged adenomyosis is those glands in the myometrium so it's going to be globally enlarged so all the the whole myometrium is enlarged and it's boggy because those those glands are kind of like mushy and soft and then endometrial hyperplasia and cancer this is um by contrast postmenopausal compared to the other two and this is due to increased estrogen exposure an ovulatory cycle which again i haven't talked about too much but this is irregularly bleeding frequency so often you'll see bleeding between menstrual periods and so frequency often it's often like every three months instead so what happens is um you're not ovulating so you're uh, we just talked about that you're you're the first cycle your endometri endometrium grows and then the next cycle grows again and eventually you got all these blood vessels here eventually it outgrows the blood supply and then you get ischemia and then it sloughs off so you do have bleeding it's just irregular it's just every three months or so and this is often seen in menarche at the start of periods and at menopause because that's when your um your hypothalamic pituitary axis goes all haywire and you stop having ovulation and what is not on the differential of abnormal uterine bleeding is endometriosis. Remember, there's no abnormal uterine bleeding because the endometrial glands, uh, they still bleed, but there's no way for the blood to leave. So you don't get any abnormal uterine bleeding. And remember, the key thing here is pain and infertility. That's the main uh, symptoms of this disease. I'm sorry, excuse this typo here. So that's it for the uterine pathology.